Hello and welcome to DevSec Talks. I'm your host, Steve Shiger, and with me today is Sam Stepanian. Sam is a chapter leader at the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP, a nonprofit organization that works to improve the security of software around the world. We'll talk about what OWASP really is, their OWASP top 10 list, the importance of AppSec, and a whole lot more. Ready? Let's get going. Sam, how are you doing today? Uh, very well. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, and thank you for having me. Amazing. Uh, Sam, for those of you uh, in the audience who don't know who Sam is, Sam, do you mind giving us a quick intro to yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Sam Stepanian. I am the chapter leader of OWASP London chapter, but uh, that is, of course, my volunteer job. Uh, during the daytime, I work as an application security consultant for uh, various financial services institutions in the city of London. Uh, my background is application developer. I come from software engineering background. I worked on various systems, including e-commerce, travel, uh, government, uh, um, uh, consulting, you name it. But uh, shifted into um, AppSec uh, back in 2005. And yeah, I think my journey is pretty much the same as for a lot of people who get into uh, AppSec. That's me. Excellent. Uh, and you've almost preempted what my first question is, because um, when people, when anyone, it, it seems that I cross paths with who has gone from writing code into securing code, OWASP is a part of their inception. It's part of their early journey in terms of education, in terms of establishing community. And that means anybody who doesn't know what OWASP is and is watching this to find out is just waiting for you to answer that question. So please, can you tell people what OWASP is? Yeah, sure. So OWASP is a uh, global nonprofit charitable organization. It stands from uh, it stands for Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, a lot of people keep asking, oh, uh, oh web. Uh, it's like, I'm not interested in it's only web only. I think people uh, talk a bit too much about the web. And I think OWASP is mainly about application security, of course. OWASP has been founded you know, over 20 years ago, where things like mobile security didn't exist. That's the reason for the letter W in the abbreviation. Um, however, I think now a lot of people think about the w, letter W as being worldwide because OWASP, first of all, is a community. So it's a global community of like-minded application security professionals, developers, architects. Um, we have members all around the world. Uh, we have chapters all around the world. And I think this is one of the most important misconceptions about OWASP because people think about OWASP as this mysterious global organization who creates this document called OWASP Top 10. But in fact, we're all a bunch of uh, very friendly people. We're all volunteers who uh, decided to donate some of our personal time in uh, improving uh, um, application security, software security for everyone by uh, being a community and of course by producing things like um, guidelines, standards, uh, talks, uh, tools, community meetups, and global conferences. Incredible. So you mentioned you are the you are the London chapter leader. So for, for people who want to get involved, does that mean there are there might be a chapter in the city that they are in watching this now? That's right. So definitely go and Google for OWASP and the name of your city chapter name. I'm pretty sure you will find a chapter in your city or in your country because uh, OWASP now has uh, over 100 chapters worldwide. Uh, we're pretty much in every single country of the world. And uh, yeah, there's a local community which runs uh, regular meetings or meetups as the modern world calls them and uh, yeah there's a uh, community meetups uh, take a form of um, mostly seminars where they are invited speakers and they talk on topics of cyber security uh, web security application security API security mobile security and not necessarily security that also talks on more generic um, topics uh, which are of interest to anyone who is interested in cyber security. Excellent. So you mentioned as part of your journey, you started as, as a developer and then you got into application security. How important is it for people who are looking themselves to get into application security to have that 
that developer side of them in their roots. Is it possible to cross over without having come from that that firsthand experience? Um, well, I think it's a big debate be, uh, happening now whether you need to be able to code to get into cybersecurity in general. And I think the answer is no. It's definitely helpful, uh, particularly in application security, to be able to read the code, to understand the code, because there are various aspects of AppSec. But a lot of people come from other background, for example, from um, I don't know, you can come even from the uh, uh, network infrastructure background, or you can come from an application support background. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that it's a, um, a, an absolute must to be able to code to be a developer. I think the uh, important thing is to understand applications and understand the topic and never stop learning. I think one of the most important things in cybersecurity, it's a, a very fast moving world, very fast moving industry, and you need to be able to uh, be open, to be constantly learning new technologies, new techniques, new attacks, new vulnerabilities, and new vectors as well. I know a lot of people do come to application security from penetration testing background as well, from the offensive world and to be honest i see quite a lot of it happening these days but let's not forget that um, we also need people on the defensive side so i see people who join usually from um, let's say a, a network background they go more into the offensive world in application security where people who join from the development background like myself they go into the defensive end of it so You've kind of you're you're, you're doing a, a great job of uh, predicting what it is I want to get into next because you've mentioned that it's not necessarily a requirement to have that coding background and the way things are going now with this movement toward everything as code, even if you're in ops, even if you came from network security, you're probably doing something in for in, in terms of coding, which is a generally an advantage, you know, just to understand how this how the logic works, and. That's what I wanted to kind of tap into next. You said you started with OWASP in 2005, or certainly with application security. And just personally, the world has changed a lot since 2005. And certainly if I, we could probably be here all day talking about that. Um, but if I just look at, look at the last, say, five years where cloud has become very normalized and we've moved into containerizing things and we've gone from writing big spaghetti code on servers to tiny little bits of code communicating at speed uh that that architectural change in that paradigm how has that been reflected in your experience in application security how what 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 approaches have changed or have the approaches changed well, that's a very interesting question, because if you look at OWASP top 10, which is the uh, guidance document, which is produced by OWASP every three years uh, for the past 20 years, um, and uh, you, you will compare, for example, OWASP top 10 back in 2004 with OWASP top 10 in, let's say, 2013, 2017, and last year's OWASP top 10, which is the uh, list of top 10 most critical application security risks, you will notice that probably 80% of these risks are the same. They're exactly the same risks, <laughs> the same vulnerabilities, the same issues that we had 20 years ago. It's, um, yeah, it tells us something. It tells a story that even now in uh, uh, 2021, 2022, we still have things like SQL injection or general injection flaws, uh, cross-site scripting. These are still the most uh, uh, authentication and authorization issues. Uh, these are still the most pre prevalent and the most critical uh, vulnerabilities. And of course, one of the interesting things about OWASP top 10 is a lot of people just take this OWASP top 10 and say, okay, if I've secured myself against OWASP top 10, I am secure. And I was like, no, there are more than 10 vulnerabilities. Top 10 is <laughs> just there to be sort of your first step. It's basically to to, if, if you don't know where to start from and you're just starting uh, securing your applications, OWASP top 10 is the first thing that you should be uh, using and looking at. But uh, obviously there are more uh, other uh, more projects and other standards that you need to look at, like application security verification standard, ASVS, which is an actual standard. Because OWASP top 10 is not a standard, it's just there as an awareness document to make people aware of the risks 
um, the most critical risks which exist in the applications. However, there are a few things which have shifted, shifted and changed it recently. And if you look at uh, cloud security, I know, of course, you are a big advocate of all, everything cloud native and everyone is now moving into the cloud. The thing is that um, oh, the application security vulnerabilities are mostly still the same. Right, and there are some new vulnerabilities which cloud brings with them as well. Well, it's important to understand that before the cloud uh, became prevalent, um, what we had uh, previously, I think the big trend in cybersecurity was things like perimeter security. Everyone said, oh, you need to secure the perimeter. You need to secure your infrastructure because people had physical servers located inside physical data centers locked up you know in racks and cages and with physical cables connected and everyone was really worried about protecting the perimeter and the word firewall was probably the number one <laughs> word on the uh, uh, being sold uh, back then but if you shift into the cloud right that approach is completely different because you have an you no longer have a physical network, you no longer have physical devices, you no longer have a physical door to lock to stop people from getting into your data center and stealing your service or sticking USB keys inside your server USB slots to copy data. So that approach is it. But now application security becomes your new perimeter because your applications is the new perimeter. And what is very important to understand that every single developer who now develops modern applications which get deployed into the cloud, whether they want it or not, they are the security engineers because it is the security of their code which will determine the security of the application and security of the organization that they represent. And uh, the change with the cloud, of course, there are some new interesting vulnerabilities which came up recently. Uh, some of them are quite specific to the way how the cloud operates. For example, the um, uh, things like uh, server-side request forgery or SSRF vulnerability was added specifically in OWASP top 10 uh, last year. And one of the reasons was that because there are uh, were so many data breaches uh, of cloud-based systems using this vulnerability that we could no longer ignore it. So this is just one of the examples of why things are changing. But overall, uh, everything is a web application. Uh, it's still a web server running on port 80 or port 443. And uh, there's a code still being executed. And uh, there's no the vulnerabilities still exist. And this, if these vulnerabilities are exploited, the most important thing which gets compromised is the data, right? And that is, of course, the crown jewel, the, whether that's a personal data, whether it's a medical data, whether it's a financial data, um, uh, sensitive data belonging to your organization. Um, that is what we're protecting. Uh, Sam, so you mentioned ASVS as, well, you said the standards, the application security verification standard. And I think when people hear the word, because the word standard is kind of overloaded, um, can you maybe add a bit of color to what that means. Yes, so uh, you can think of ASVS as a uh, framework as well, uh, but it is unlike OWASP Top 10, which is um, a guidance piece. Uh, ASVS is the actual standard which has uh, things that you can verify. Right? That's what's called application security verification standard. Uh, verify that uh, you don't store passwords and clear text, for example, is one of the topics inside the SVS. And it basically has different assurance levels uh, based on your application. And I think it is um, uh, something which really needs to be adopted by all organizations. Um, and you can adopt it as a metric of uh, your application security posture. You can just use it as a guidance. You can give it a, a, to developers and convert it into user stories and say, well, do we have a, uh, do we have a story for this? And um, another interesting um, topic that you can use for ASVS, uh, I would like to see more people using it. They can even use it during the um, uh, procurement of vendor selection pr process and say, okay, dear vendor, you're trying to sell me an application. Is it verified against ASVS? I wanted to ask about misconceptions of application security, and perhaps even the OWASP top 10, but there, there's something you mentioned when you, when you were talking about the OWASP top 10 just now, and you mentioned new entries. And one of the new entries that I wanted to ask about was insecure design. Um, and that feels like, well, I came at a, 
I want to say four. I could look it up. Four. I think it's fourth on the list. And that's a very high entry for a first appearance of a new entry. And I'm just, I, I feel that there's a, a certain, maybe I, I just would wonder if you have any insights into how that arrived, because I think there's a perception of the OWASP top 10 as being application security vulnerabilities, but that's very much a more left thinking style of, of, uh, yeah, entry. That's right. That's right. Yes. And uh, I think um, insecure design um, uh, was quite heavily debated, <laughs> I think, by many, many people. Um, however, uh, we had to add it in. And this is another very big misconception about OWASP Top 10, since we're talking about misconceptions, because people think of OWASP Top 10 as a list of vulnerabilities. They're not. They are risks. And that is the biggest difference. Insecure design was put into OWAS top 10 specifically because we're seeing more and more vulnerabilities caused by the lack of the security in design of the applications. And we need to distinguish between the secure design and secure implementation. So basically, um, there could be, um, well, if you're writing an application, you can just implement it in the insecure manner. And that is completely different from the uh, security. We, we basically, you cannot code your way out of the insecure design. And that is why it is uh, it is in the top 10. And I think it's quite important uh, that people start doing uh, things like threat modeling, because um, uh, some people think of this insecure design entry in OWASP top 10 uh, as a lack of threat modeling vulnerability. So you can think of, about it as well. And I think this is very important that the uh, threat modeling is introduced into the SDLC developers and people involved into the application uh, lifecycle. They, they perform threat modeling at every single step and actually think about all the potential threats, everything which can potentially go wrong with the application uh, and uh, provide mitigations and then um, run the evaluation and understand have they done a good job by analyzing the possible threats and uh, providing mitigations. Before I got into the distracted by uh, the OS top 10 insecure design, I, I was wondering if there are any, not just misconceptions of the OS top 10, but common errors or mistakes that you see in people's implementation of application security in industry that if anybody's watching this and wants to avoid, is there anything that, that, that you see happen over and over again? Well, there are quite a few of them. Uh, number one is the fact that people think that they can secure themselves just using tools um, and things like scanning tools. And uh, I think that's the greatest misconception. Uh, I remember back in the day when I was installing web application firewalls, so it's a true story anecdote when I went to a very large bank in the UK and uh, there's a piece of uh, compliance called Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, or PCI DSS, which obliged all the organizations to uh, do a code review based on the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities or have a web application firewall. And when I arrived at this bank, I said, okay, where's your web? They said, okay, we, we, we have a web application firewall and I was supposed to configure it. When I arrived there, I said, okay, where is your WAF? Where was your web application firewall? And I said, oh, let's, let's, they couldn't find it. They just were looking for it everywhere. And eventually they found it in the storerooms. It was somewhere in storage on the shelf because they said, well, the standard doesn't say anything about it being switched on, plugged in, configured, it's <laughs> in the traffic. What we were told, we only need to have a WAF. So yes, we have it. So we're compliant. <laughs> so oh, wow. uh, true story. So this is the same thing about tools. People say, oh yeah, we have a, we have a we have a SaaS tool, right? And like that is the, this is this is the biggest misconception, I think. Um, and there's another thing which I see with since we mentioned SaaS tools, right, or DAS tools. Uh, SaaS in particular, I think, suffers from this misconception. I see many organizations, including very large organizations. So. What they do with, for example, SAS, they just perform uh, with, uh, scans of the code. Um, so, and they did not, nothing with it. So, okay, we've scanned 80% uh, of our application source code, and that is their target. But this is the biggest mistake. Why are you scanning your application for vulnerabilities if you do nothing with these vulnerabilities? There's another, and mostly it happens because people don't understand what to do with these tools. Uh, I also see situations where people do scan the applications 
then they look at the actual number of findings that they get from the scanners and they just get too scared with them and just don't want to touch it so it becomes yet another form of technical debt and i think that is one of the biggest misconceptions and i also see misconception related to that that when people see vulnerabilities they don't actually understand the metrics how to measure how, how to measure improvement in application security and uh, they they just look at the sea of red of their high and critical applications and uh, that's all all they're looking at and they say okay let's get rid of them but sometimes they cannot right and i think um the understanding of metrics is currently missing uh, in many many organizations that i worked with and of course the other big misconception that i need to talk about that is um uh, secure coding education because if you are not educating your developers how to code securely then uh you uh well you will not have a chance to improve your application security posture because uh, in the modern world as you know everything's agile everything moving very very quickly we have this move fast approach to building a lot of applications um, that means if your developers don't know how to code securely the number of vulnerabilities will only go will will only increase Okay, well, from there, now that I've heard about all the different pitfalls and I know that I can't solve it with tooling and education is important, if I'm an organization, well, maybe I'm an enterprise organization, maybe I'm a, I'm a startup or a medium-sized organization who wants to start building my AppSec program, where's my value for money start? Or where's my almost maybe essential start? Well, very good question because I think the... Um most essential start is uh, education so you need to start educating your developers and uh, you need to make it fun right you need to gamify it that is the only way how you can approach it properly because uh, what i see again another big misconception and uh, in many organizations they say okay we have to educate developers how to code securely so what they do they buy a uh, training course and they ask developers and say okay this is a mandatory course you all have to go through it and uh, you have to complete it but what actually happens it becomes one of the other boring training courses that everyone just looks at the screen and clicks on the next button yeah yeah i know this and then next 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 and in the end they learn nothing right that mm -hmm. is not a good approach to to uh, uh, training people and applications to training developers. The correct approach and the much better approach, of course, is to make developers engaged. You need to engage them. You need to give them something like a game, gamified approach. You have to run uh, capture the flag tournaments and mm -hmm. competitions. Uh, and another thing which I, I believe works really, really well uh, in my experience is doing this anatomy of a hack lunch and learn session. So if you don't know how to educate your developers, say, okay, today we're going to have a lunch and learn session and we're going to do a live hacking of one of our applications or some other application that they know about. Um, and I can assure you there will be lots of lots of people who will want to sign up for this session and understand what's going on and they will learn application security in the background without a um, the mundane uh, mandatory uh, you, you must complete this course approach so it's much much better if you gamify it uh, get developers engaged uh, you can also play various games in it for example OWASP has absolutely free and open source uh, uh, games uh, for your developers OWASP Cornucopia is one of them it teaches developers how to do threat modeling that's another very fun thing to do that they can do. There are other games available. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is a uh, pretty cool approach. Uh, run um, secure coding tournaments, team versus team, and then get them to score points. Uh, I, I discovered that developers really enjoy when you ask them to join a secure coding tournament and then you give them something physical they can win like a drone i think the second developers here oh i can win a drone <laughs> <laughs> by by proving i can find the vulnerability in the code yeah i definitely want to do it and this is how they become engaged and then you tell them okay dear developers uh you have to register in the secure coding uh tournament system but 
do not give us your real names. You have to think of a hacker name for yourself. And they, they, this makes their creative juices flowing. And then they see the leaderboard where they see all these hacker names and they can see them, their hacker name climbing in the leaderboard as they compete during the tournament. Um, that makes the whole process fun. And um, if you measure uh, the, your, your metrics before and after, you will see an immediate return on investment. So secure education for developers is number one make it fun, make it uh, engaging, um, and uh, you, you will instantly see um, the improvement. Uh, so we're just on the edge of running out of time, and I want to ask you a big question to finish, and that is, where, what are the gaps? What do we need to fill in the next five years, and where do you think we're going to be in terms of AppSec? Is AppSec and InfoSec going to make friends like Dev and Ops, and are we going to get a merge? Uh, what, 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 what is your vision? Ah, very tough question because uh, it's changing almost uh, daily, uh, the, the situation. I think there are still uh, a lot of gaps in terms of understanding um, of the value of application security. Uh, you don't really hear about AppSec that much these days because if you look at all the big headlines, they talk about ransomware and data breaches and data leaks but no one is actually talking about the uh securing applications um i think uh, we need to increase the visibility of the vulnerabilities in applications um and uh what needs to be done to um, improve the security posture i think that is at the moment is not quite there we are slowly moving towards it uh but uh, I, well, based on my experience, I think there's not enough of it at the moment. We, of course, need to also improve the uh, education uh, of developers, and we need to bring threat modeling as a much needed practice uh, as well. And I think another trend, which I think this year is probably going to be uh, announced a lot, uh, is going to be software supply chain uh, security and things like uh, software bill of materials um, uh, I think it's quite important thing to understand and have uh, after the log4j spring uh, log for shell and the spring for shell vulnerabilities one of the biggest problems that suddenly became apparent that people don't even know what they have right they because when log for shell happened people say started looking at do we have uh, anything using log4j? Do we have Java applications? Are we vulnerable? Are we exposed? Right. And um, uh, I, I think the uh, software supply chain issues are going to be quite quite big. And uh, again, OWASP can help because we do have a, a software bill of material standard called Cyclone DX, which is an OWASP project. And we also have a free and open source tool which can help you track your components and in, or ingredients um, in your uh, software supply chain called dependency track, uh, which can import data from various sources and answer the question, uh, do you have uh, a component which is vulnerable um, in your organization? I think this is the um, quite important these days. And it's very similar if you go to the supermarket and you decide to buy a box of cereal, what do people do first? So they look at the list of ingredients. So same thing should happen with software because uh, these days no one is writing software 100% from scratch. People use a lot of third party, a lot of open source libraries. And um, as we know, vulnerabilities happen. And when these vulnerabilities happen, you need to be able to answer the question, are you vulnerable? And in order to answer this question, you need to answer the question, do you know all your components, uh, all the software libraries and frameworks that your organization uses. If you do, then you will be able to answer that question. And I think going back to our education thing, Steve, now you reminded me of another thing. If you are going to train your developers, you yeah. also need to have a uh, sort of an inventory of your developers because nowadays, mm. a lot of people who develop code, they don't actually have a job title of a developer. We talked about this earlier, you mentioned because there are people like ops people, network engineers, there are people who write code who are not necessarily 
developers as per their job title. Same thing is very true for things like what we call user-defined uh, functions and um, citizen developers. These are people who will write things like uh, Excel macros, for example, or Python scripts trying to uh, help them solve a particular business problem. But what happens then is you will end up with lots of this small uh, uh, applications written in Python all over your organization which are written by people you had no idea were actually developing those. And maybe these people are the ones that you skipped in your big AppSec secure education development program. So remember about these as well. Always identify people first and identify components. That's the identification um, problem I think is quite important. A big thank you to Sam for sitting down with me today. And thank you, OWASP, for all the great work that they do. Thanks to you as well for watching our conversation. That's all for this episode of DevSec Talks. Make sure to click the link in the description for more info on our series. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to know when we add new episodes. Got any great ideas for future episodes? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.